Okay, welcome everyone. This is the Foundation for the Economics of Sustainability's COP26 Reflections video. And today we have five panelists who went to COP26 who can share their experiences with us. And hopefully we have some lessons learned for future activism at the COP. My name is Mike Sandler. I'm the chair of FASTA, Foundation for the Economics of Sustainability. Check us out at FASTA.org, F-E-A-S-T-A.org. And um, to get us started, I'd like to hand it over to Teresa O'Donohoe, who, is the, who, who went to COP. And it's not your first COP, is it? You've, you've been to COPs before? Or was this your first COP? Um, this is my first COP. OK, first one. I've watched, yeah, I've watched from the distance. That's why I was so eager to give feedback is because I used to sit at home in Ireland going, what's going on today? What's going on today? <laughs> yeah, great. Well, tell us, um, you know, share with the group what made you decide to go to the COP, what your experiences were like there, and any lessons learned, and also maybe some of your interactions with the youth delegation that we had. My reason for going was because it was in Glasgow, it made it accessible for me. Um, but it's something I always wanted to do, so it was brilliant to be able to go. Um, what I, the reason I kind of wanted to go is because from years of listening into what's going on, I get frustrated that this is a talking shop continuously talking and the people who need to be heard are not even listened to. And it seems to be all about um, the oil producing companies or, or nations. And um, I wanted to be able to see that for myself so that I could actually report on it. And there's a lot more validity in saying I went there. This is what I had thought might be happening and this is what is happening and it is <laughs> um i think the most um eye-opening part for me was the morning roundup we used to get with ringo ringos as members of ringos with the research and independent ngos that was really insightful to hear feedback from people who had gone on observing in watching the um, negotiations and the frustrations that it must be even worse sitting in there, not, not being able to say anything. That, that actually, when I heard I could be an observer, but not open my mouth, I was kind of like, oh, I don't know if I should be in the room really. <laughs> and it's probably just as well I didn't have enough time to do that because I was only there for three days. Um, so if their feedback was very um, frustrating, annoying, depressing, everything you don't want because of the way they reported on how the oil nations would um, argue about putting stuff on the agenda or say they don't want to talk about it today and and just make the agenda be half the meeting before they even agree an agenda so that that sort of thing really really annoys me it's a real patriarchal practice from what i've seen and uh invalidates everyone else who wants to say anything uh would you like to introduce our youth delegates that are on the call here and what your interactions were with them and then we'll hand it over to some of them for some conversation Okay, thanks, Mike. Yeah, we have Marina and Saoirse here. Um, my interactions with Marina and Saoirse were probably just breakfast one day and having a chat. <laughs> uh, well, we had, we were in a WhatsApp group. And so we kind of were touching base on different things that were happening. And we were, I was, you know, feeding back, this is what happens. We go to these morning updates from Ringo's and, you know, but realistically, get in what you can. The whole overwhelming experience as well, I was happy. I don't know if, if either Marina or Saoirse have been there before, but inside is nearly, it's, it's your, it's going into a whole new world. So we were just talking about that and not to be afraid to be overwhelmed because I think everybody goes in thinking they might, or what can I actually achieve here? But so we had breakfast and that was really, really good because we all got a chance to feedback. So I'm going to hand you over to Marina and then Saoirse. Thanks. Uh, Marina, would you like to tell us a little bit about your experience at the COP? And you were there for the whole two weeks and some of the things you did in terms of what were you advocating for and what were some of the challenges that you faced while you were out there? I was not expecting that whole amount of like overwhelming and a lot of things happening at the same time that we couldn't like keep track most like my main agenda with the Fridays of Future Brazil, mostly delegation was climate education. We had a manifesto and was really great because we could meet some politicians that didn't receive us here in Brazil, 
but they went to COP and they were like, oh, let me take a picture with these youth delegations that are here at COP, let me receive them. So it was mostly media for them, but it was really important for us because we could like, like really debate about climate education. That is something we don't have here in Brazil. And also to talk about uh, the youth representation because the, the official Brazilian delegation, like the, the nation, right, the party, the pink badge, they didn't debate with the youth. They didn't like receive us in any circumstances. So it was great to see how huge was the Brazilian youth delegation there and that I could like join them. And if I could take like one main, um, thing from this COP was uh, that would be the power of connecting with other people that feel the same thing that you feel because we are all young people and we all couldn't be like having a really important and great um, talking in the negotiation rooms but we were on the streets we were on the corner we were like everywhere near COP near the negotiation room and we were like connecting with each other and talking about our demands together so I think it was really great in the sense that we could really talk with politicians but they they were not like there to really listen to us so I think the most important thing and what I love the most about COP was to really count on other people that I was working online for years that I could meet them for the first time. And I think that was it, like COP can be really overwhelming, can be really tiring, stressful for a lot of young people and for everybody that is there for the right reason and not only for like bad negotiations. And I think when you can find a group that is there for the same reason that you are, that is climate justice and not only like advocating for fossil fuel. I think that's, that's the greatest part about COP, that meeting everyone. <laughs> that's great. And um, can you tell us a little bit about the MAPA group, the MAPA, right? That's what you're part of. And, and do you coordinate with other um, countries, people in other countries and how that works? And also tell us about, did you spend more of your time inside the venue or outside in protests or both? Cool. There's a lot of things happening inside and outside. So we try to divide ourselves. But about MAPA, MAPA means most affected people in, in areas. And Brazil is part, it's like another word for global south, but also includes BIPOC, indigenous communities and people most affected in the global north. So um, MAPA, we had an amazing delegation, like we did a lot of work before COP to make sure we would have a great representation of, because we know, we, we talk a lot about the colonizing and like climate, how the climate crisis is intersects with like the colonization and sexism, racism and everything. And we need to decolonize even inside the youth climate movement. So mostly our work with the like Fridays for Future MAPA was to really bring MAPA folks to COP and for us to don't have only like European young people that is really easy for them to go to Glasgow and like it's a whole trip like days traveling to get to Glasgow coming from the global south. So I think mostly of our work was this to really bring our voice to COP, to this important place, and end the protesting even outside or inside the venue or like press conference opportunities or any kind of media opportunity, we really tried to shift that to MAPA folks. So I gave a lot of interviews, not talking about like the global perspective, but the Brazilian perspective, because my country is really being affected right now. And that's what I wanted to like, talk in Glasgow and talk with like media from other countries. So uh, I think, uh, yeah, that was mostly our work with the MAPA delegation to bring our voice and to talk about the now perspective because in inside um, the COP venue, I don't know if you saw some pictures, if you weren't there, there's a lot of like banners with pictures about climate disasters and written now in front of it in, in bigger words and like, now okay it can be a picture but there are people that are being affected right now and they are inside cop and uh, this cop was really excluded and really elitist compared to the others because of the covid pandemic because of the you no know, money exchange because pounds is really really expensive compared to brazilian highs that i can say so 
yeah, we did a lot of work before COP to get there and a lot of work during COP to really speak up and talk about the reality right now in our countries and after COP, that is to like track all the negotiations and see if the developing countries, the developed countries will really give the support they promised since Obama, he promised that 1,000 billion has billion dollars that hasn't arrived yet. So, yeah, that that's mostly what we did. And about uh, things inside COP and outside COP, I kind of try to divide myself, but sometimes it's really hard. And I think this pressure in so young people to oh, you need to see what is happening in the negotiations because you need to know what you are talking about, but you also need to go outside and protest and speak up. So there is like a lot of things happening. And like now, one week, one week after COP, I kind of I, I was at my house trying to process everything that happened. And that includes not only process the negotiation results that were not what we were expecting, but also process the like a lot of people that I met, a lot of situations, stressful situations in the past. I think that's that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, we want to go back to Teresa real quick because she has a couple more items um, to say before she goes off, and then I have one more question for you, and then we'll go to Sersha. So Teresa, you wanted to wrap up uh, a few ideas, some closing remarks from you? Yeah, I found my notes. <laughs> um, just, and I'm sorry to run off before you, Saoirse, but we've, we've already done a radio interview since we got back anyway, so we, I've heard what you thought as good as I did. Um, I Yeah, the placating of the youth, that came across very uh, strong. You know, the volunteers, they do it all for free, and aren't they brilliant, blah, 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 blah. Uh, well, why aren't you listening to what they have to say and why don't you pay them? Sorry, that's what I think they should be saying. My sarcasm, I hopefully won't go over people. <laughs> so it's so condescending to the young people. Then I found, uh, especially in the meeting with the Welsh MP for future generations, I think it's Sophie Howe, um, that was really inspiring. I would love to see us have a minister for future generations. But what came very became very prominent because we did have some Brazilian woman you, you probably know who it is Marina I haven't written down we have all these people fighting to get to the table and to be involved and to participate yet having fought that fight and getting to the table doesn't really matter we're still not listened to so how do we jump that hurdle of getting everybody to the table and being heard so that the people who are outside banging to get in to the table don't come up against the same thing we have as, oh, come on in and join us at the table while you're being ignored. So let's get to the table and be listened to at the same time if we can. And how can we do that? I'd love to see us do that. So there's two things I want us to find out is how do we get to the table and bring everyone else to the table and be listened to? And can we have a minister for future generations? And with that, I'm very sorry, but I do have to go. <laughs> Thanks a million, Mike. Thanks, Teresa, and, and thanks for inspiring us to have this reflections uh, conversation. That's really great. Um, let's thank you. Uh, Marina, I want to go back to you and ask one more question about the COVID situation because, oh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, like I, I wanted to, to talk something about what Teresa said because, like, how you get to the table and is not ignored on the table when you are talking. So um, I think it was like right after the negotiation ended, Boris Johnson, he made a tweet saying, oh, small countries and oh, I don't know, most affected countries were really hard to ignore. He really said they were, you make your voice be heard and you were hard to ignore. So maybe you shouldn't have ignored the countries that are being affected right now. He really tweeted, oh, small countries were there, they speak up and they were hard to ignore. So you shouldn't ignore the people that are being affected now. So that's, I, I'm just laughing, but you, you should laugh rather than cry. <laughs> For sure, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about the COVID situation because I think, did, were you, did they tell you to quarantine and how did that go? Were, there, were, did, were they set up to allow you to do that in a safe way? And I heard people had to go get test results and there were long lines. So tell us a little bit about what you had to go through with that. Uh, this COP was so disorganized in that sense of uh, COVID restrictions and like accessibility for countries that are not developed, that are not in Europe or US. 
Um, so we need to wait until two weeks for COP to buy our plan tickets. Um, because we didn't know if we would need to quarantine and like about the badges, I was like so lucky to have a badge before going to COP because some friends, they need to just like go there and see if they will find a badge. And if they didn't, they would have to justify themselves to the UK government. They would need to like do more, more COVID tests. So in this sense, um, it was great to have a badge because the life was easier because like you go there and then they paid for my COVID tests, but the informations were not clear until you go there and ask for yourself and like the places to do the test. Like there was a place in front of COP, but that took so long. I wait, I think like one hour in the line and like after before going to COP. And then when I went to COP, I need to do like another lateral flow test every day. And, and that's only like for security. I'm not like saying bad things about the test, but the organization that like they made us do the test. So I think that was hard. I didn't need to quarantine because they took Brazil out of the red list like two weeks before. But I saw some friends that they came from Uruguay and Uruguay was just like Brazil. And then they already like some organization were paying for the plane ticket. And then the organization paid for the plane ticket like one month before. So counting with the quarantine days. And then when the UK government said that they wouldn't need to do quarantine anymore, the, the organization couldn't pay for another plane ticket or for the rearrangement. So this friend of mine, she needed to pay for her, like from her family, they did a crowdfunding internally and pay for another, pay for another plane ticket. There was no support in this shift of like, their internal organization because they could like release this change of the list right before COP. They knew that a lot of people were coming from countries that COVID was really hard and they knew that they could like release there early because it would make our life easier, but they didn't. So I think like um, to talk about security relating to COVID, I felt safe in the sense that, oh, I knew everyone is being tested every day, but the way they did, the way they released the information, the way that like you need to find a lot of things for yourself to try to, to solve the whole mess for the first days. So I think that was really hard, but yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, what I have you. to say. Thanks, well, we appreciate it. And uh, we might bring you back in for another question uh, later, but I wanted to ask Sersha, Sersha, are you there? <laughs> Hello. Um, Hello. Hey, hey, how are you doing? Um, I wanted to just give you a few minutes to give us some of your reflections. I remember reading, we included in our week one update, some of your um, uh, reflections on your first week there, and some of the challenges that you had. And also, what would you say to other youth activists who maybe have been protesting and doing school strikes, and they'd like to get involved at the international level? What, what would you say to them? Yeah, so I suppose um, for me, it was like, uh, you know, like it was said before, it was really, really inaccessible. Um, and that information um, really was not shared anywhere, not just in terms of COVID testing, but in terms of, you know, whether, you know, what badges you needed to get into what sessions and uh, when the sessions were, like the agendas weren't published until the day before. Um, and you know all of this really confusing stuff every single day for two weeks um and none of it improved ever uh like another thing about cues you know they had ten thousand people going in uh through single file um so it took about two hours one of the days that i was there to actually get in um and just waiting in the queues um and then you know, and then they also accredited 30,000 people, but they only had capacity for 10,000. So um, now this never happened to me, but apparently um, there were notifications that were sent out that would, that basically said, oh, the building has reached capacity, you, you can't come in. So there were people waiting outside to get in as well. Um, and it was really, really, really badly managed. Um, and there, it, it was really also intimidating because there were so many police there as well. Um, and obviously I'm someone who is quite privileged in terms of police um, and, and how they react to me. Um, but at the same time, I felt very uncomfortable, not just for myself, but for, but for my, my friends and my colleagues and, 
um, it's just it's not nice to see so many uh, armed, bulletproofed, you know, uh, police just, you know, you know why they're there. Um, and they're there for protesters. And it, it, it was it was really it was scary in some ways um, because, you know, a lot of activists don't trust the police because, you know, we, we carried around bust cards with um, informations uh, of a solicitor we could get in contact with just in case. Um, even though I personally was not putting myself on the line, I carried it around just in case, because this was something that we were very, very much aware of. Um, and another thing as well as that was like, you know, the inaccessibility, uh, not just not just um, in terms of getting into events, also physical inaccessibility. Um, I remember hearing stories, I mean, one of the negotiators actually couldn't even get in because it was inaccessible but also I I was talking to a couple of people you know there in the event and they were saying like even the even the the pavilions which are which is where we had to spend most of our time because we weren't allowed into the negotiation rooms even there they were elevated um and so physical accessibility was another issue there was also no um accommodation for people with uh with you know neurodiversities that might need specific sensory rooms so there, there were no sensory rooms as far as I'm, I'm aware um where people could go and relax and this is an especially stressful place and this is where it's needed the most um and that was that was really concerning um and there's just, there was just a whole host of things that were going on that was really really problematic um and you know you would hear i personally I didn't keep up to date with the plenaries because to be honest I can't I don't really care what world leaders are saying because they're just saying the same thing they've already always been saying I don't really care what Boris Johnson has to say he's not going to say anything new and that's the same for for Biden and that's the same for for Modi and that's the same for anybody who's speaking there and they're just going to say the same thing and it's not enough so I don't really have the time of day but, you know, I'd been hearing things about people talking about civil society and, you know, how great it was how, that this brought 30,000 people together from around the world. But civil society were actively kept out of the room. Um, I mean, that was what this COP was designed to do, was to keep civil society out of the room. Um, and that's really scary because that's undermining democracy. Um, and so that that was something that I was hyper aware of as well at the, um, when I was there. Uh, but in terms of getting involved in an international way, I mean, to be honest, I don't even know, I don't even, I wouldn't even say I'm involved in an international way. I don't know, like, <laughs> um, I don't think, you know, a lot of people think in terms of the climate, if they think of it as a big organization and like, oh, you can like, you know, make your way up the ranks and you can't really do that uh, because, you know, first of all, obviously it's very, very difficult to keep in contact um, if you know one person lives in Kenya and like you live in Ireland and then somebody else lives in Canada and somebody else you know so there's that difficulty um, but obviously like as with every other climate movement there's issues within the movement itself in terms of of diversity and in terms of um, just general intersectionality um, and recognition of like there's not really like a place that you can get to where you're like oh I'm an international activist um, unless you're a member of a very specific kind of group. Uh, so there was a lot of tensions ten within the climate movement as well, which obviously wasn't easy. Um, but I would say to activists who want to get involved more internationally, just like, I mean, I don't have an exact piece of advice, but I would say, you know, apply for everything you can and just go for it. And sure, look, like you're always going to get involved in groups that are very, uh, youth tokenistic um, and that's just the case that's what every climate activist has to face the, the youth tokenism and the greenwashing those are the, the two things that we, we all unite us um, and I think it, you know it's there's something to be said for reforming a tokenistic system um, and I think that's something to be aware of as well. Alongside the, the protesting, we need the reform. And that was part of the reason why I wanted to go into COP to see the negotiation processes going on uh, and to protest, obviously, because that's also really, really important and um, just as important as, as the, the negotiations themselves, if not more. Um, but I, I think, yeah, it's, it's difficult because, you know, to be honest, COP made me lose faith in leaders and made me lose faith in our structures, but it didn't make me lose faith in people. 
um, because there were so many people there who were like, we all came together and we were so powerful together. Um, and, you know, even though I didn't get to protest while looking into a world leader's face or something, I know that they were scared of us uh, in a good way, not in like a, not on a terror, like they were terrified or anything, but like they're worried that, um, they're worried of the world that we want to create because uh, they don't have any part in it. Um, and I think they're starting to realize, especially a cop, there's, there were so many young people coming together at that event uh, and I suppose it's all fine and well reading about, you know, the millions of people around the world, but there it felt real, uh, that people power and the youth power and the fact that this movement is global, it felt real. Um, yeah, I really miss it at the same time. It was horrible. It was really horrible, but it was also really awesome. Uh, I, I miss all the people and I miss the chanting. Um, and I miss like... I don't know, Scotland's a pretty cool country. It's it's very similar to Ireland, but it's a pretty cool country. Um, and, you know, it's just, you know, that, that people power, that power, you don't get it that often. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. And that's that's a little bit of solidarity. I did a couple protests, uh, the Seattle WTO protest in 99 and a WTO protest in, in uh, Mexico in 2003. And you get this international coming together in solidarity. It's really exciting. Um, I asked Marina this, and so I'd like to ask you, what percentage or what amount did you do inside the venue versus outside? And was it helpful to have the badge to go inside? I mean, I know it's frustrating inside the venue, but um, on the other hand, if you don't see it, you only have to rely on other people's descriptions, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, it was definitely interesting to be inside um I would say there was a mix I wouldn't maybe a balance I'm not sure because if some days I decided to go in later or uh, there's a couple of days where especially during the high level leader summers where everything was closed down that I didn't go in because there was not really much of a point to um and I kind of got to the point where every time I went into cop I was really angry. I was just really angry. As soon as I entered and I saw those posters, you know, with the now, <laughs> um, I, I got really, really angry because I was like, this is so useless. All of this, what is the point of this? Um, you know, there's so many people here with their business suits and I don't know why they're here and I don't know what they're doing. And they're probably one of the 503 fossil fuel company representatives. Um, or maybe they're from a company that's trying to hone its greenwashing. Um, and, you know, it felt really, really, really bad. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think it's important for me to have seen that, I suppose, in some ways, because uh, it did radicalize me a lot more. Um, in a good way uh, and it did kind of you know put it into perspective that it's the few really inside those events who who are doing all of that you know I don't even know I don't know what half of them were doing genuinely like they were just sitting there typing away and I don't know who they were and it was really confusing because it's like you know I've never seen so many um, old white guys in suits in one place um, and like, this is not really the place where I expected that. Uh, and yeah, I suppose that is a different world. It is, it's an entirely different world. It's a corporate world that you only really hear about when you watch those like um, biographical drama things, you know? Um, <laughs> and I suppose that was really, really, really odd. It felt like you were crossing through a portal uh, and it felt like, it felt like prison. And it felt like the most depressing place in the earth. And it felt like school um, all wound up, up into one. Like everything was just, I don't even understand half. I don't understand half of what I remember. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense. But like, you know, there's stupid, stupid things. Like the food, for instance, was really bad, first of all. But that's beside the point. But it was, um, it was really expensive and really inaffordable. And I remember thinking yeah, this is really for the few. And I, and we talked to some, you know, local business owners around when, when we obviously had to eat out some of the nights 
Um, and they were saying how basically like delegations were coming in and and they were spending the whole time to de the delegate country delegations were spending the whole time using taxpayer money to just sit in a hotel um and it's like you know a lot of activists had to pay from this from their own pockets and then you know the fossil fuel delegation or the different country delegation they get to just sit around and do nothing uh and that was really it's it's a it's a weird weird world I don't understand how people can, can be so disconnected from their their ethics and from what's going on around them. I just don't I just don't understand. It felt like we were dancing at the end of the world, you know, queuing to the end of the world to watch it and cheer, I guess. Um, but outside, I, I suppose I suppose I, I would say that's probably where I spend most of my time. I don't really know. Like, again, it went by in a blur. Um, yeah, I, I probably did, but I, outside, like I said, it was such a different world. It felt so much more natural and personable and powerful than those places. Um, yeah, sorry, I rant a lot. <laughs> I have a lot no, to say good. about this. <laughs> Thank you. No, that that's really great. And uh, we are just so happy to support you guys to be able to go. And uh, we'll be in touch about future opportunities as well. So stay in touch with us. And uh, maybe we'll get more involved in youth climate justice work at FASTA because it really is very important for you guys to be there, to have your voices heard. And like you said, to the, for the people that are inside that bubble to all of a sudden see you guys and be like, wait, what? Like, it'll, it'll shake things up. It'll change things. So I, with that, I wanted to go over to John and ask for some of John's input um, just from what you've heard, what your experiences were at COP. Um, and any other kinds of things. I know you had an article that was published just before you left. So anything you'd like to share with the group and for others? Well, it's great to be here and join the debriefing and to hear Marina and Sersha's and Teresa's experience. <clears throat> I would identify a lot with it that the first thing is this experience of overwhelm when you go in and there's so much going on and you try to think, where do I keep my focus? And, uh, and there's also, when you go in, you feel a bit despairing of when you see the there's a it's like a trade show with all the industrialists you know trying to make a bit of money from the the climate disaster if you like proposing all these different solutions of mixed value and so forth and then all the countries representing themselves and there's this sort of false optimistic tone that everybody's doing something and then you feel the screaming out you're not really and uh, and 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 so forth and then you can feel very pessimistic about the outcome like Teresa that meeting we went to looking at how the the activists and the groups and the Ringo participate in the discussions and their frustrations was very uh, very revealing uh, about all that. Um, and I suppose my, my focus when I was there, uh, I was trying to think, because I wasn't, I'm not an optimistic about it in many ways, because I think, you know, as predicted, the outcome isn't enough, you know, and not nowhere near enough in terms of the, the, the agreed solutions that, that the governments have put together and so forth. Uh, but I suppose my, my focus really was thinking, how can I support, you know, because uh, my background is mental health and working with young people and families. How can you support people to keep going? Because whatever happens, this problem is not going away. And um, and like uh, Marina Sersha, you can get sort of overwhelmed by it. Uh, and you can also give up about about that there's nothing uh, you can do about it when, when you, you have to keep going. It's a bit like a, it's a marathon, not a sprint with this. And even though, things uh, will get worse and um, could get a lot worse. There's still, you can't give up trying, you can't give up trying to be there, trying to push your voice, trying to uh, for, uh, force what you can to happen. So within that, there was those strands of optimism or hope for me. And uh, I had that balance, this dilemma, do I stay in the pavilions or do I go out? So I did go out for the youth uh, protest the, on, the, on the Friday. And that was a, a, good, a great decision. <laughs> So that was the most moving part of it for me to see all the families there. I was very moved by all the families there because I'm a, a family, I have my own children and so forth. And um, and then to hear all the young people one by one speaking from uh, across the world, from the areas very, very, uh, very affected by this. And I had a very special conversation with one of the youth activists from um, from uh, Alaska, you know, and, and how that's impacted there. So uh, and listening to try to think, what supports do, do, do you all need? Like, what do you need, Marina and Saoirse and, and all the other youth activists uh, as part of the grey, old, stale generation 
that uh, who and the I was joking with Carla. Why was I going? And I was I was going to take the blame as the older generation uh, uh, for this. But there is an opportunity as well to, to as to what can we do to support uh, you know the future generations in this uh, difficult situation. And that's my uh, my focus. And when I was there, uh, I did have some very helpful interactions with groups who were thinking like that. It was very interesting because everybody goes through the same trauma. Like I was talking to the hard-nosed scientists, glaciologists, uh, you know, the, the guy studying peatlands and the collapse of the tundra and them dealing with this. They're watching this death of the world themselves and, and the emotional impact on them uh, uh, was very interesting. And like they need to be supported to keep going <laughs> as much as the, as the activists as well. So, so the, the strand of hope was it happened, people came together and we have to keep keep coming together. You have to keep doing that. Uh, at least there was a COP26 uh, and we have to keep keep going in the practice. So, so I think I think what you were saying, how fast it could get into this, let's get into this area. So we'd like to do this more to support uh, young people and, uh, and, and the broader so about what they need to keep going in this very important area. Thanks, John. Um, I'm gonna switch over to Caroline now. And Caroline, you were also there. You also kind of played a role in, in helping out some of the youth activists. Um, and it wasn't your first COP. You also went to COP21 in Paris, where I was there too. And so um, any kind of things that you noticed there that you wanted to bring into your reflection? Um, and then also just from the FASTA perspective, there were some exciting things around the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, BOGA. Um, and how that might interplay with CAP Global Carbon, which is what we were trying to promote from FASTA. So uh, I'll hand it over to you, Caroline. Um, yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, I suppose for me, um, a difference between the Paris one and this one, and of course you were at the Paris one too, uh, was that this one felt even more exclusionary. Um, I was kind of reminded of a, an airport. I mean, was I was already reminded of an airport in the Paris one, but this one reminded me even more of an airport because only a small minority of people in the world can fly, and only a, you know, and of those people, they're predominantly white and you know, and privileged and all the rest, middle class or more. And um, you know, arriving at the COP was was like arriving at a discount airline kind of place where you got into little queues and you went round and round and round and then you got into another queue and then another queue and so on and you went through security and so on and then when you got in it was you know there was all this stuff up on screens and it was all very bewildering and you're trying to figure out what's going on and there's all this hustle and bustle and people rushing around and uh, people were sort of you know, like Sosha was saying, you know, there was it was hard to tell what a lot of people were doing there, and I would be sort of trying to look at people's badges without being too obvious about it. You know, like what's you know what's this person? And there, and there were all these people in little groups. I was very struck by the way people clumped together in groups. You know, and how hard it is to break through that sometimes. You know, like you're in your group, and then you know you might be curious about something going on near you, but you know it's hard to break through, and sort of you feel like you're invading or something you know and uh and the, yeah i felt like it was it was interesting and maybe a big part of the problem is this difficulty in breaking through groups and talking you know outside your own group you know to people who are kind of in another group and um another thing that really struck me was it was energy access and again there's an analogy with the whole world there i think because uh when i got in um I kept overhearing conversations about, oh, I just need to find a place to charge my phone, or I need to, you know, get a place to charge my laptop, and then I'll talk to you again. And so there was, a, there was always there's a scramble to get access to sockets to plug in your stuff and charge it. I don't know if the others had that ex experience. Maybe it was worse for the first few days, but but um, it was really market, and I, and I thought, wow, this is really like, you know, it's like what's going on in the world. You know, people don't have enough energy access and. You know, and it's very uneven, and you know, uh, some people have tongues, and hard, other people hardly have any. And there's, of course, that affects how well you can communicate both between yourselves and then with the outside world as well. So, you know, that all sort of goes together. And um, yeah, so it was, it was. There's this weird frenetic atmosphere, kind of like an airport. And um, but like Sosha said, I was really struck also that you know, I in some ways I loved being there, but in other ways I hated being there. And you know, I don't know if, if Marina, you felt that or John, but but you know, it was a weird mixture. Um, and I felt in some ways, a lot of ways, very privileged to be able to be there. Uh, but I was also there were some things that were just incredibly frustrating. And I also feel conscious as an older person there that of the of the danger of 
sort of saying, or, or you know, I think we have to be really careful about um, not uh, sort of putting a burden on the young people, you know, and I just feel like, you know, I, I, some of the what I hear, what I heard from people of my generation really troubles me. It's like, you know, all oh, the young people are so wonderful and it's so great, you know, that they, they've come and they're going to be able to solve this. I mean, that's kind of the idea. It's like, you know, almost let's pass this on to them. And I just feel that's so wrong in so many levels. You know, we're the ones who've been doing this, you know, and it's we need to have the young people's voices here, but we shouldn't be saying they're the ones who have to solve it, you know, and it's crazy. Um, so sorry, now I'm ranting, but but I just yeah that really struck me sometimes. And then um, yeah, I was also very moved by the Friday protest. I was at that one, the, the first Friday, um, where there were a lot of indigenous people speaking on the stage, and I just uh, I found that whole part very moving, and of course very different from what was going on inside in in the blue zone. And um, some of the events, I mean, it was hard even to get into the big kind of open events in the blue zone were hard, let alone getting into negotiations and so on. And, you know, you had to kind of line yourself up early and get your spot, you know, and it was it was really hard to, to go negotiate that stuff. Uh, but having said that, I was at one that I really enjoyed, which was about um, economics and uh, donut economics and well-being and changing, moving away from growth and all that kind of thing. And I was pleased that they had some people in who were willing to talk about that and that they gave them a platform. Um, it was a mixed bag, though. It wasn't perfect. And one of the problems with it was that it was too rushed. They crammed a lot of people into one short time and there was hardly any time for questions. So there wasn't really a discussion. Um, there was, uh, I mean, there was Kim Stanley Robinson, for example, but, you know, it was, was uh, he was kind of rushed in. He said his bit and he was wheeled out again. You know, it was like just really quick, you know. Um, so, I mean, there were lots of different people. There was a uh, Kate Pickett, who I enormously admire, who's written a lot about inequality and the problems with inequality and how equality is a good thing. And she was really brilliant, you know, but again, it was, it was very short, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was a it was a real mixture for me. And I can't really find one word to describe it all. But just in terms of FASTA, um, it's true that there's this new alliance um, which isn't a, it isn't a central plank of the COP, it's not to do with the central negotiations, it's a side thing that's been set up independently by some of the countries who were at the COP, and they've just come up with this, I don't know who influenced them or how they came up with it, but anyway, um, it was started out with Costa Rica and Denmark, and then uh, they were spent, I think, quite a bit of time talking to people in other countries during the course of the COP, and then on the Thursday of the second week, they had this press uh, press conference, which was actually one of the biggest ever, apparently, for a side event for a COP, because the word is all around. Because this is quite interesting. What they what they're talking about is it's kind of more or less it's keep it in the ground, but it's keep it in the ground not just for new developments, um, new fossil fuel extraction and so on, but also phasing out existing fossil fuel extraction. And that's really important because, of course, there's a lot of existing fossil fuel extraction that we need to we need to eliminate. I mean, we can't just be thinking about the future ones. We need to be thinking about what's happening now, as has already been said today. So, um, you know, to us, that's very positive. Uh, there are things to watch out for because it's, you know, it's for the moment, there's no real, as far as I know, structural attempt to um, incorporate solidarity with the Global South. So there is Costa Rica, but it's the only Global South country that's involved. There are um, a total of, I think, nine now countries and regions that are involved, but the only one that's, you know, MAPA or Global South is Costa Rica. And, you know, so I think there needs to be more done. That would be my strong advice to these people um, uh, to bring in the Global South and to make sure that there's some kind of solidarity, some kind of climate justice, you know, incorporated right from the start. Um, also, I, I, um, France has signed up, which is great in some ways and a bit problematic in others because France is very nuclear oriented. So, you know, it's just something to be aware of, you know, getting rid of coal and gas or oil and gas doesn't necessarily mean it's going to all be wonderful. And of course, there's also the small amount of coal, you know, so there's there are various things to be careful of. But, uh, but generally, uh, you know, we think it's quite positive or you know, it's a tiny step forward, let's put it that way, but it, it, could, it could go further, you know, which is good. Um, is there anything else? No, I think I think that's it. Have I forgotten something, Mike? Or are you sure, no, I, just to add what you were saying about the BOGA Alliance and how it may relate to cap global carbon, which is what FASTA is promoting. 
And so we, I, the way I looked at it and I watched that kickoff event is that the BOGA Alliance is part of the cap. So countries can sign on to a cap, um, but then the next step would be to do a price on carbon and to take those revenues and return it back to people. So BOGA is maybe just the starting point. Um, and we at, at FAST are promoting these other steps to take it further along to where we think we can actually phase out carbon um, and send the economic price signal throughout the economy and then protect households who are gonna face those costs. And I remember seeing a lot of talk about loss and damage, right? They're trying to do climate finance for loss and damage. That's how they call it. That's their framing. But we're kind of looking at maybe a universal basic income as a way to approach those, those issues because I don't know what a person in the Philippines might need after a typhoon. But if we're able to send them money on a monthly basis through the carbon pricing uh, situation, they'll have some money and some support for whatever the next crisis will be because we don't know what it's going to be. And you know we can't predict where these things are going to strike, but we know they'll probably strike everywhere. We have fires in certain parts of the world and floods in others, you know, and so universal basic income could help address that. So I think that's one of the things we've been trying to promote. And we have a lot, long way to go still, but it was nice to see the BOGA part come out because that could be a starting point for these conversations. Um, so thanks, Caroline. Was there anything else you wanted to mention? Um, I think maybe we covered it. Um, and I guess everyone else, does anyone have any kind of last words here? Or you think you're, did we kind of cover what we meant to do today? I think we did. So great, everyone. Uh, we're, we're, why don't I stop the recording? Um, we'll just encourage folks to go to the FASTA website to learn more. And thanks again for your reflections on COP26.